Hello, Berkshire Waldorf School families and greater community. My name is Jenna Goodman, Administrative Coordinator for our school. Thank you for joining us for this exciting parent series discussion on Why Waldorf? This educational event is relevant for all families. Whether you are new to Waldorf and the work of Rudolf Steiner or a seasoned alum, Waldorf schools have been educating creative thinkers for 100 years and suddenly feel more relevant than ever. I'm honored to present to you our speakers for this evening, Pamela Giles, Beth Oakley, and Dr. Stephen Sagarin, as they bring to us a look into why Waldorf education works so well for early childhood, grade school, and high school students. Pamela Giles is a Waldorf teacher and educator. Mrs. Giles has been involved in the Berkshire Waldorf School community since its founding 50 years ago. She has graduated three BWS eighth grades, taught several partial classes, and continues as a main lesson guest teacher in the grade school. Currently, Mrs. Giles serves as a mentor and collaborator, spending time in elementary classrooms at BWS and other Waldorf schools. She's also a Waldorf graduate, having attended the Rudolf Steiner School in New York City. Beth Oakley earned her degree from Bennington College in Literature and Early Childhood Education. She discovered Waldorf education while student teaching public school in Southern Vermont, and soon after began her teaching training at Elkion Center at Hawthorne Valley, where she earned her certification in Waldorf Early Childhood Ed. She assisted for two years at the Waldorf School of Saratoga Springs in both the nursery program and the forest kindergarten before beginning her career as a lead teacher at BWS in 2012. In 2015, Ms. Oakley moved to Los Angeles and it was our good fortune that she returned to the Berkshires to rejoin our early childhood faculty in 2019. Stephen Sagarin, PhD, is an executive director, faculty chair, and a teacher at Berkshire Waldorf High School in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. He is also associate professor and co-director of the Waldorf Elementary Teacher Education Program at Sunbridge Institute, New York. He is author of The Story of Waldorf Education in the United States, Past, Present, and Future, and a second book, Rebel with a Cause about Rudolf Steiner and education will be published in 2021. He has a PhD in history from Columbia University and an AB in art history and fine art from Princeton University. He has been a teacher for more than 30 years, including at the Waldorf School of Garden City, New York, the high school from which he graduated. For tonight's discussion, Dr. Sagarin will open with a view into the 100-year history of Waldorf education. We will then segue into an overview of early childhood given by Beth Oakley, followed by, followed by a grades discussion presented by Pamela Giles, and closing out with a look into high school with Dr. Sagarin. In between each section, there will be time for each teacher to answer questions that were submitted in advance of this evening. Please note that this offering is being recorded and will be available to the community after the event. Thank you all for being here. As we begin this exciting evening, Dr. Sagarin, I now hand it over to you. Hi, everybody. Jenna, thank you for that nice introduction. So my first remarks are very prepared. I'm going to read them from my screen to make sure they fit in the time allotted. And it's really look at the founding of the first Waldorf School in Germany in 1919 and the, the circumstances and then the impulses behind the founding of that school. In just more than 100 years since the founding of the first Waldorf School, we can celebrate more than a thousand Waldorf schools in more than 60 nations, serving about 250,000 students, including this school, Berkshire Waldorf School, and the Berkshire Waldorf High School, where I teach, and all of our students and children. These numbers, of course, represent great success and achievement. We would do well to remember, however, 
that Rudolf Steiner did not intend us to found a thousand schools, nor to become an alternative to other ways of teaching and learning. Rudolf Steiner intended us to transform education in the modern world for all children everywhere who might benefit from it. We have a lot of work to do in this regard. I hope that the next hundred years we'll see the growth of Waldorf schools, including this one and the high school. But more important, I hope that the next hundred years we'll increasingly see Rudolf Steiner's educational ideals, principles, and methods made available for all teachers, all parents, and all children who would welcome them and benefit from them. Their implementation is not without challenges. The United States today is not Germany then. And there are healthy tensions between the world that Steiner addressed and the world in which we now live. And also between our world and the better world that we can imagine and for which we work. Creatively addressing these tensions is the hard, joyful work of teachers, administrators, parents, board members, and friends of any Waldorf school or any attempt to put Steiner's ideas into practice. In 1919, Europe had been devastated by what we now call World War I, but was then often called the Great War, or even the war to end all wars. In Germany, England, France, Belgium, roughly one in six young men had died. Died from rifle and machine gun fire, from explosive shells, from poison gas, and from infection. And half of all the young men of this generation from these nations, many, many millions of young men suffered grievous injuries and wounds to their bodies and to their souls. The war started, we are told, because in 1914, a Serbian nationalist assassinated the heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, one of the last of the European empires. Because of secret alliances and rigid mobilization and battle plans, the machinery of war began to grind. Rudolf Steiner, as what we now call a public intellectual, traveled all over Germany, speaking to as many of those with power and influence as he could, trying to convince them of a path that would not lead to war. He was active, but I don't think that his work could be called activism in a partisan sense. He was attempting to help those who were blind to see in order to deter human suffering. He failed and war ensued. Germany was not more guilty of promoting or prosecuting the war than were France or England or Russia. But because Germany occupied the trenches opposite the victors and because the German battle plan of 1914 called for aggression, Germany was judged guilty and held accountable. Some of you watching may remember that Germany made the last payment on its war debt for World War I only in 2010, on the 20th anniversary of the reunification of Germany. Germany ended World War I impoverished, humiliated, and in debt. It suffered hyperinflation followed by the worldwide depression of the 1920s and 30s. All of this laid a firm foundation for the rise of national socialism, and the actions that led to World War II and the further devastation of Central Europe. Rudolf Steiner did not despair. He spent the war mostly in Switzerland, a neutral nation working with persons from many nations, including those that were at war against each other, and including visitors from the United States, which didn't enter the war until 1917. Together, they built the Goetheanum, a meeting and performance hall that was and is at the architectural heart of Steiner's work. And Steiner also turned his efforts toward the implementation of a threefold or tripartite social organism, a healthier way of conceiving our lives together in political, economic, and cultural or spiritual terms. Following World War I, Emil Malt, a man with a deep and sincere interest in Steiner's work, asked Steiner what he could do to promote peace and justice, and what he could do to further Steiner's description of a healthy social organism. Molt happens to have been the managing director of the Waldorf Astoria Cigarette Factory. He had made a small fortune producing cigarettes, which in those days was intensive hand labor requiring many laborers. Steiner's response 
was to agree that Moult found a school for the children of the workers at his factory. The workers told him sadly, it's too late for us, but it's not too late for our children. Perhaps every generation can say this of itself. Children educated according to the needs of the times and according to their own growing humanity could develop to avoid the rigid intellectualism, moral blindness, and lack of personal responsibility that had led the Western world to war. Although he never formally taught there, Rudolf Steiner became the director of this school, the independent Waldorf School in Stuttgart, Germany, an industrial city that is also home to Mercedes-Benz. The school opened in 1919 with more than 200 students in grades one through eight. The first eighth graders had not previously had a quote unquote Waldorf education. There was a kindergarten for less than one school year. The school closed it because it needed the space to add an additional first grade. The school grew quickly to more than 800 students with large parallel classes in all grades. It added a high school almost immediately. And from that first school have grown all other Waldorf or Steiner schools in the world, including ours. The growth rate is about 10 new schools per year. At this rate, all of the children of the world will be in Waldorf schools in somewhere between 100,000 and 200,000 years. We have a lot of work to do. So regardless of how we find ourselves in this Zoom webinar, we can say that we are gathered here because of Rudolf Steiner and his work. And we are here because of Emil Molt. And we are here because of the workers at the Waldorf Astoria Cigarette Factory. And we are here because of the cigarette factory workers' children. Not many in the industrialized world are humbler than a cigarette factory worker's child in Germany after World War I. Some truly had no shoes. The youngest had never known a world not at war. Many were malnourished. Most had never tasted chocolate. Emil Molt made sure to give every student a piece of chocolate on the very first day of school. And finally, we are here because in Rudolf Steiner's words of the quote, good spirit who gave Mr. Malt the good thoughts to found the school. Steiner does not say who this good spirit is, but based on our reading of Rudolf Steiner, we may guess that it is the dragon slayer whom Jews, Christians, and Muslims know as the Archangel Michael. Steiner describes in one place Michael as a, quote, set of powers, and also as the guiding spirit of our time. Among other things, this spirit wishes profoundly for us to educate our children to enable them to become ever more fully human, to think for themselves, to imaginatively unite the divisions that separate us from each other and from the natural world and finally, to find no hindrances to the love that they may pour from their beings throughout their lives. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Seigren. That is as moving as it was the first time I heard it. We will now hear from Ms. Oakley and she will bring to us an early childhood overview. Thank you, Jenna. And thank you, Steve, for that incredibly moving, incredibly beautiful picture of Waldorf education and its history. Um, it still feels so relevant for everything that I do every day. So I really appreciate that. And thank you, Pamela, for being here. And thank you, Jenna, for putting it all together. Um, I consider the opportunity to speak tonight to be a great gift because though I am often speaking to parents about day-to-day -day goings on or sharing reflections about individual children or my class, I'm swimming in the world of Waldorf so much every day that I never really have taken the opportunity, <laughs> admittedly, <laughs> to think about why. Um, why is this education so essential? 
why am I here? So the title of this webinar really made me take a moment and think. Um, a dear colleague of mine once said to me that when she reflects on Waldorf education, she likes to consider the future. Um, education and schools were created in our country and around the world, for better or for worse, to fulfill the needs of future society. But what human qualities do we really need for the future? Or even more pressing, what do we need right now? Our world is hurting in so many ways and what do we need to make it better is what really, really um, sits with me. And I think we need empathy and interest in the other. We need love for nature. We need resilience. We need imagination and creativity. And we need a love for learning. Um, every day one can find these qualities being taught <laughs> in our early childhood programs. And I say taught with air quotes because in Waldorf Early Childhood Education, the children learn through imitation and by following repetition and rhythm every day. And every moment is an opportunity to learn. Um, when a child bumps or pushes into another and they are hurt, rather than a hurried apology, we go and get some cream together for the hurt child and ask if they are okay and if they need anything else. Um, we spend time learning about nature by existing in it. We learn in the woods, rolling, climbing, bumping, building. We hear seasonal stories and relish in the changing seasons. I just sent um, a letter to my parents about this concept in Vermont called stick season, which is what's happening right now. Um, and I mentioned that I just love that New Englanders have a name for this time of year and a reverence for it, a real reverence for it. And it is so beautiful when you look outside and you see everything's just this quiet gray color and the trees are all there and everything seems to be kind of waiting for something. Um, so even just now when we're outside in the elements together and we are really outside right now, um, I like to think about that. Um, in nursery before we were all outdoors, um, we, spent a lot of time getting ready. And we children um, thrive in that natural world and love experiencing it, but we build that resilience by not only being in the natural world, but by allowing the children the time to do things for themselves and by making mistakes while they do it. Um, for, so when we were getting ready, I would be there to assist but all the while, I would really encourage the child to do it on their own. Um, and I cannot put into words the joy in a child's face, the simple pleasure of having dressed themselves, um, of having really done it, gotten themselves each layer on and all the layers we need to get on and not tangled anything. Um, the true reward of I did it is um, second to none for child and teacher. Um, in Waldorf Early Childhood, Another top priority is imagination. We foster imagination by allowing the space for it to happen, um, by using the magic of simplicity. And simplicity can create such magic. We use simple toys that are open-ended and they can play, be, be played with any which way. Um, and then rather relying solely on picture books, we tell our stories or do simple puppet shows so that the children are allowed the space to create their own images and interpretations of things and of those stories. Um, and all of you who are parents know that young children love repetition. And so those stories I will often tell over and over and over again, and they don't get tired of it. And there's a magic point that happens after maybe a week or two of telling nursery children the same story where they really just get it. And sometimes it feels like you have pushed it a little too far, but then it's like a whole new story and they're participating in it and they're singing along with all the different parts and they're really just living it. And though some people might say that it's just doing too much of the same thing over and over again, what I see is that the children find real comfort and love in just living in those beautiful stories. Um, 
children are coming to us from a very busy world that does not move at their pace at all. And the Waldorf Early Childhood Curriculum helps them find a way to slow down, to get ready, to know themselves and to know each other so that they eventually, eventually have the wherewithal to meet that world head on. In many ways, even our beautiful classrooms are sometimes guilty of getting overly complicated or even full of too many things. And this year I am truly rediscovering simplicity because I've had to move outside um, and I'm re-embracing it. I'll uh, share a little anecdote about this. Um, though I'm in love with being outside every day, I really love it. I was lamenting missing my class puppet table. It was a staple of the Rose Room and in previous school years when we were indoors for part of the day, I would always do a tabletop puppet show for the children and leave the table open during free play. And as the year wore on, the class would begin to do their own puppet shows during playtime for each other. It was very sweet and sometimes the whole class would just hush and it'd get really quiet and a full story would be told verbatim by one of the children, which made me feel really good as a teacher. Um, but just the other day, I was outside after lunch and I looked over towards the sandbox and there was my class all in a little row, sitting quietly while one little girl did a puppet show. And the children had gathered pine cones to be the people and rocks to make the landscapes. And they found a big piece of wood to be the stage. And let me tell you that moment was worth more than beautiful dolls or silk curtains or sheepskins. And um, the moment was really the true essence of Waldorf Early Childhood Education. Um, Steve, I'm actually always reminded, um, I think about this often, about how you once told me during my teacher training that no one needed all those accessories to have a successful Waldorf school. <laughs> you could do it with some <laughs> sticks and seashells on a dirt floor in a hut somewhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that really never rang more true to me than it did watching those children. Um, I'm so grateful for the stepping back and the undoing that the outdoors is providing me this year. Um, it's reminding me to keep it simple, which is perhaps the number one piece of advice I could give to parents, which is, when in doubt, simplify. Um, I just want to mention that it's notable too that all the things I've spoken of today relating to what makes Waldorf education so important and relevant are less about materials and more about qualities. And when I truly boil it down, what I see every day of my classroom and even with my own son at home, who's just three years old, um, is that we are giving these children a gift. And that is the gift of time. Time to try, time to resolve conflict ourselves and help a friend heal if we hurt them. Time to put our boots on the wrong feet <laughs> and both of our legs into one leg of our rain pants and then take them off and start over. Um, time to spill flour all over the floor and then learn to sweep it up. Um, time to sing in the sunshine or feel the rain on our tongue to roll down a hill. And even time to sob in our teacher's lap until we feel better. <laughs> um, Rudolf Steiner spoke about Waldorf education as a healing education. And I think that that is why he and Emil Molt founded that school. Um, he said that teachers are to be removers of hindrances. And it is my hope that I can both protect young children from being overwhelmed while simultaneously help a child overcome anything holding them back. In our class, we like to say, you can do hard things. That's one of our <laughs> things we say every day almost. And we can, we build confidence, interest, inquisitiveness, love, purpose, and courage in an intentional, unhurried environment so that when the children go forth into an academic classroom, they truly are ready to receive what is given. We are not, so to speak, preparing them for academia. Rather, we're giving them the tools they need to allow their natural curiosity to blossom into a love of learning. 
And I think a lot about that famous trope, which is sometimes attributed to Michelangelo, but it's not exactly his quote. It's sort of all from many different sources, but that idea of the angel in the marble, that the sculptor simply removes the marble that doesn't belong to create the masterpiece waiting within. And we are not forcing our own image of what the children should be upon them, but rather we are helping walking by their side and letting them emerge in their own unique way. And now I think Jenna, will I be answering questions? Okay. Yeah. I will look over the questions. Um, I see one up here. Um, how do we continue the Waldorf experience at home? Well, I would say your first step, as I just said, is to simplify. Um, if you feel like there's too much going on in your day, there probably is. And I don't, and we learned this when we were in lockdown, um, I don't expect parents to do beautiful circles with their children every day. I don't expect them to have all wooden toys. In fact, I've had parents apologize to me on home visits for having plastic toys. And I've told them that, that I'm not here to inspect your house. I'm just here to be with you. And um, I don't expect a perfect Waldorf home, whatever that may be. Um, what are things that you can do to bring it home is Make sure you have a rhythm in your day. Just make sure you're doing the same things at the same time every day and it's not too crowded. Um, and I will just also say this is for early childhood specifically. Um, you can find little chores for your child to do alongside of you. Children love to imitate adults doing chores. They're not any happier really than when they're washing dishes or sweeping beside us. And make sure when you do that, that you allow that time for mistakes, because that's a huge part of learning. That is one of the most important things we do at school. And that's harder for parents at home because you feel like you have a schedule and you have to get here and you have to get there. So if you allow that time and you can even just schedule that in if you're really type A, um, but if you allow that time for your children to help you around the house, You'll find it extremely, extremely rewarding for your relationship with your child, and you'll find that it'll help foster a sense of independence and well-being in them. Um, I'd also say little rituals like singing at the dinner table, saying a little blessing together, that can be really, really nice to open and close a meal, open in with a simple blessing like your children sing at school, and close it with a little thank you, and have a little candle. Um, you can have candles other times too, like at bedtime or, you know, even um, when you're doing something really like sweet and important together, um, like beginning your morning or if it's a dark day, you can light them inside. Um, and I would also say that reducing the time that your child spends in front of a screen, if not completely eliminating it for children um, of a very young age, um, seeing about working towards that so you don't have to do it cold turkey but Rudolf Steiner loved to talk about striving and while their teachers love to talk about striving too it's one of our favorite things to say on parents nights we're not supposed to be perfect but we're all striving and that's how I speak to parents about media I really think that it's a process and it's a slow undoing especially for some families but you'll find that the less it's there the less your children will ask for it and you'll find that they will have a greater sense of being able to play on their own and being able to create their own worlds and games. And it actually might bring you even more peace. So it's a big task and I'm always here to help people with that too. And I also especially don't judge parents for doing it because it's just, really, really hard to parent today. And we can all be forgiven for all of our little slip ups, but it's a great time, especially now that your children are back in school, to really kind of take that on as your challenge for the school year. Um, and I think that sort of answers that question. Um, is there time for me to take another, Jenna? You can do one more, yes. 
Okay. Um, let's see. I'll just do this one's really quick, but um, somebody was wondering about the difference between Montessori, Waldorf, and Reggio Emilia. Um, so I was actually a Montessori kid, um, but I can't <laughs> speak too much about it. I know that it um, that Montessori definitely is based a little more on child led. So when I was in Montessori school, I had a schedule for the week, but I could kind of make my own time as to what work I was doing um, at a very young age. And in a Waldorf early childhood program, we kind of move away from that and we create the schedule for the children. Um, there are similarities like woodworking. I think Montessori has a lot of really great um, qualities and ideas that I use, you know, in my own classroom and in my own um, time with my son at home. Um, I would say the main difference is the um, amount of child directed and led activities versus teacher directed and led. Um, Montessori is also a little more academic in the early childhood years than Waldorf. We are academic, but we do it in a rather unconventional way because we don't do formal instruction, as in, this is the letter A and, you know, this is A apple at, or this is what, you know, the alphabet is. We, that gets saved until first grade, um, and it's not done that way. It's done in a much more beautiful way. Um, and uh, Reggio Emilia is also um, quite child-led and, in fact, even a little more loose. Um, Reggio Emilia is um, the children sort of will get an idea and kind of work on it together and um, make something happen. And they sort of lead not only the day, but the curriculum. So it's, it's kind of a much further away from what we do. We, as teachers in Waldorf classrooms, lead the curriculum and um, Montessori sort of in the middle and then Reggio Emilia is a little further over um, to in the child's hands. Um, but all three use natural materials and um, have really wonderful qualities. So. Thank you so much, Beth. That was beautiful. And now we will hear from Mrs. Giles in regards to the grades. Well, thank you so much, Jenna and all the people behind the scenes who have organized this. I'm really honored to be part of this panel. Tonight, I'm Pamela Giles, and I thank you all who preceded me for your really interesting and inspiring words. It's just a subject, even after almost 50 years connection with this school, I find fascinating and always changing. Dear Berkshire Walder School community, I first want to say that you are to be commended and congratulated for being able to offer from early childhood through high school in-person learning these last months. I think it's just absolutely fantastic and a real um, expression of your courage and working together of faculty, parents, board members, and probably so many other people in the community. I think it is a tremendous gift for our children, for this generation, for now and for their future. No matter what happens next, it's just amazing that this has happened up until this point. I also want to thank the class teachers of the Berkshire Waldorf School for allowing me to speak on your behalf while you are busy preparing your lessons for tomorrow. So, and lastly, I want to say that I, I really miss working in person at the school. I usually am visiting classes and talking to parents and talking to faculty members, students, staff, and um, that's a wonderful collaboration which has changed to this new um, media and we are going to continue, but I really look forward to rejoining the group. I will now try to share with you some of the thoughts about these elementary school years. Um, 
Almost a hundred years ago, Rudolf Steiner met with a group of educators in Torquay, England, and said, there are no prescribed rules for teaching in a Waldorf school. Only one unifying spirit that permeates the whole. Most of my professional life, I have been seeking answers to this question. What is the unifying spirit and how does it make our education unique? A few of my thoughts are what I'm going to share with you tonight. <clears throat> I have found that Rudolf Steiner's insights on child development and the human being recognizing both a spiritual and physical growth provide the strong foundation on which our education is built. And that is for the present and for the future. When Rudolf Steiner first spoke to teachers, he introduced a picture of the child, of child development in seven year cycles. Beth really spoke so beautifully about the first seven years and the qualities that the children respond to best in that time. Seven to 14 are the elementary school years, which I will touch on, and Steve will speak of 14 and beyond. Rudolf Steiner, in that picture of those, within that picture of the seven years, spoke really unceasingly of the need to educate the whole child. The child, the part of the child that has the thinking, the part that has the feeling, the part that has the, the activity of the will, the head, the heart, the physical activity of the limbs. So we are challenged whatever age we are teaching to create a lesson that involves all aspects of the human being. In the life cycle of the frog in the second grade, in understanding the suffering of Buddha in the fifth grade, in a fifth grade biography, in building of a DC motor in the eighth grade, each lesson must be most carefully thought through and designed so that the child, the student, can be awakened and engaged in this whole way. How does this happen? It is really a hard task, and your class teachers are home tonight thinking about these very, very questions. Well, probably everybody knows that there are a, an inordinate number of meetings in a Waldorf school. Constantly, you're always, what the teachers are meeting, the teachers are meeting, the, te the class teachers are meeting, the early childhood teachers are meeting, um, committees are meeting. And really, what are teachers doing in all those meetings? One of the things that they are doing in those meetings and the main content of those meetings is studying the education, studying child development, examining, reflecting, reviewing, looking at our programs, looking at our curriculums, and really asking ourselves the questions, uh, is what we are doing meeting the needs of the children that we are teaching today? What do we need to change? What do we need to update? And what is timeless? and classical. These are fascinating questions and we all have so many opinions on all of them and that is one of the reasons why we have such long meetings. I think this little um, COVID challenge that we have had and the success of Waldorf schools in adapting to it in really such a short time is a testament to a very functioning, highly functioning, successful adaptability muscle in the faculties of the Waldorf schools. And this has been substantiated by all kinds of 
really interesting articles on the way different schools in different parts of the world have continued in-person learning. I think it's very significant. As well, we must recognize that this process of working together is a creative process, and it is why the Waldorf method can be referred to as an art. The art of education or education as an art. Details of the curriculum and how each one of these developmental periods relates to the curriculum that your child is learning in a specific grade is given by class and subject teachers in class nights. And I urge you always to attend those because they are informative, interesting, and really inspiring. Overall, the elementary school curriculum through the high school unfolds like a spiral, opening and circling, offering an ever widening view into the subjects of the world. I hope that Steve will also pick up that theme a little bit when it comes to high school. As my topic is elementary school, I will return to the classroom. And I have described the way the teachers um, study the child development and the curriculum, and that comes together programmatically, and they bring this into the classroom where they meet the students. The students really are the most important part of the school. And that is where the dynamic process of learning begins. The students bring their interest, their enthusiasm, their love for each other and their teachers, sometimes expressed in most unusual ways, and they are ready to engage fully in whatever is brought. Thus, the beginning of the day is the first lesson is called the main lesson or the morning lesson. It's a two hour period of time lasting three to four weeks in for study and concentration of one subject. One of the things that Rudolf Steiner wanted to do by su suggesting this main lesson, morning lesson study, was to bring a focus to the day. <clears throat> it is in this lesson that the art of education can be practiced, that educating the whole child, the will, the thinking, and the feeling can become part of that experience. I have two examples that I want to finish with. And um, though there are so much that one could talk about in the elementary school years. First graders are introduced to numbers through stories that lead to discovery and observation. What actually is the largest number? What do we find one of in one world? How can a circle made from our class allow others to join and still be one circle, one class? Does one actually include many, many parts? Understanding and experiencing oneness through discussing, movement, standing in space, drawing, gives the child a sense of the vastness of one, a number that can include all. And this concept of inclusion is, an, is developed in our curriculum throughout the grades in so many ways. The quality of a number, of course, walks hand in hand with a quantitative understanding of a number. And then our students are prepared to learn four processes, multiplication tables, measurement, fractions, geometry, algebra, and they're well set for high school math. At every age, math is a lively, interactive, 
process of discovery and practice. And, would, and the time passes very, very quickly. The art of education allows the teacher to deepen the learn experience of learning at every age. There are certain times and ages when a subject can really connect with the inner state of growth of the ch child. The ninth and the 10th year, usually fourth grade, is a time of inner and outer change for the child. The child often expresses this, but often does not. And we have to look and see how this sense of being connected with the whole world of childhood is shifting and changing and a feeling of separation and disorientation, one could say, is coming about. There's a marvelous poem by Shel Sil Silverstein called On Turning 10. The child is asking, as I said, maybe out loud, maybe you have to intuit that, who am I? Where am I? What better way to orient a seeking child than introducing geography in the fourth grade? Recently, as Mrs. Fernbacher was preparing her fourth grade geography, we had a chance to have many interesting conversations. Geography in a Waldorf school begins where we, the students, are. So that is different in every school, in every town, in every state, in every country in the world. For our fourth graders, the geography study begins here, indoors or outdoors, at our desks, and with the four directions. Here I stand, under the sky, the center of the world am I. Am I facing north? Am I facing south? Am I facing east? And am I facing west? This process of becoming oriented in the physical world is one that mirrors an inner process of becoming oriented as well. As, as ever widening circles of <clears throat> classroom, school, town, <clears throat> and state geography, are introduced, the child can step with confidence, joy, and connection to make a contribution to the larger world. Though I could continue, I think I have probably taken my time, and I wanted to just refer to a couple of the questions that Jenna forwarded to me. Um, Jenna, how are we doing with the schedule and so on? You may answer, you have time to answer a question or two, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So there are a couple of questions, and then I know Steve can pick up some of the themes I've started and show how they are completed in the high school, and he can um, shore up anything that he thinks needs shoring up. One question. How do children learn to read at Berkshire Waldorf High School? Well, I was so impressed with what Beth was saying because I feel like everything that Beth was describing as part of learning, experiencing in early childhood is a preparation for reading and learning in an academic way in the grade schools. So that when the early childhood student makes that trip in our school across the um, road to the lower school and comes into the classroom, they are really ready for this new form of the main lesson, which um, I talked about. But if you think about the main lesson in relation to the 
six, seven-year-old first grader, and you think about engaging and educating the whole child, the thinking, the feeling, and the willing, you know that you are not going straight from this time of play and activity to sitting in a desk. It's a, first grade is a very transitional year. And so these images that, have, that are being built up, that turn into the letters, that are a, a vehicle for practicing sound, for identifying sound, um, that is the work of the first grade, putting letters together, knowing what combinations are. But it is done through activity, through beauty, through drawing, through walking, through speaking. And the light, it's, like a pl it's like play, except that it is appropriate for the child who is six and seven. So that's the beginning. And then, of course, they're the nuts and bolts of reading. And that is something that we all learn. And it takes practice. And it takes really understanding where each child is at which at the moment and knowing, do they need to work on their short vowels? Do they need to work on consonant blends? And I think, and I will say over the decades that I have worked at the school, we have gotten better and better and better at identifying the needs of the children early and knowing how to support them. So uh, it's a, a subject I could talk about in great detail and would be happy to um, go into with anybody who really wants to know more about that. Then I think there was a question about homework and I was kind of smiling when I was listening again to Beth because I was thinking, what is homework? Homework really is the chore of the um, of elementary school. Homework is, a, is an exercise in remembering. What do I have to do? When do I have to do it? And it's a connection between home and school. So it can happen in a very slow and gradual way. Formally, we don't bring, we don't ask the children for a lot of academic homework in the lower grades by any means. We will ask them to take a book out of the library, take the book home, remember to bring the book back. They may have a, a ring of words in the second grade of sight words that they will take home. They will practice and they will bring them back. So obviously the homework is very different according to what grade it is, but um, building this connection between home and school, I think that is a lot what homework is. And homework is also, again, what Beth was saying about allowing children to do the work on their own and make the mistakes. That's really the same theme that is carried in the elementary school. You may be better at putting on your, your rain pants and tying your shoes, but you may write your multiplication problem on the wrong side of the paper. And you do need the time and process to be able to self-correct and to do it in a safe atmosphere where you can build confidence in your process of learning. So I think that's a few ideas, a few thoughts in that direction of homework. Anything else, Jenna, that you found that you wanted me to address at this point? No, I think that was beautiful. Thank you so much, Pamela. Okay, Steve, all oh, you're on. Jenna, do you agree that I'm on? I do. We Excellent. have to refer to you now. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks, Beth. Well, I have some things written down, but I, before I say those, I would like to say um, one way that it occurs to me to speak about this, the transitions that you're hearing about tonight is to say that the 
the early childhood program, you could say, focuses on the good in human beings. And the elementary school focuses on the beautiful that is available to human beings. And the high school focuses on the truth that we can seek in the world. Steiner was sort of obsessed with the number three. And so he recognized in the Greeks who talked about the sort of unity of the good, the true, and the beautiful, um, something that, that, that he could apply when he came to, to, talk, to speak about education. So I think we all agree, I, I, I would bet a lot of money and I'm not a gambling man, that we all agree that, that children need to be protected. In fact, it's one of the principles that Steiner and sensible people discuss when they talk about educating children. But of course, children grow up. And as they grow up, the world perhaps asks them to grow up too quickly. Maybe it tries to sexualize them at too young an age. Maybe it asks them to become sardonic or to understand irony at too young an age. And so it's our job to help them slow down a bit and protect, protect them from the influences that would make them mature too quickly. I think you've heard about that this evening already. But the world doesn't stop there. And right around the age of 13 or 14, when children, at least in the modern world, have entered puberty, but have not yet developed the emotional maturity of adolescence, the world kind of does a kung fu or jujitsu move on them. And instead of saying grow up too fast, the world says stop growing up altogether. McDonald's, Nike, Anheuser, Bush want you and me and our children not to grow up, not to develop judgment, discernment, not to think for ourselves, to remain pliable and available for consumer capitalism for instance. And so our job as teachers has to transition fairly rapidly, beginning in middle school, maybe at the beginning of middle school, from a gesture of protection to a gesture that more and more includes and honors liberation or maturation. I think of this transition as beginning really around fifth or sixth grade. And even though I teach almost exclusively high school students and graduate school students, um, I just sort of want to get a running start at the topic. And so um, I, made a, I made a not very high tech drawing to show you. So oh, if, I, if I have shown, hidden my self view, then I can't see if I'm doing a good job of holding it up. There you go. And so, our physical growth begins rapidly and then trails off. And at a certain age, we read our reach our maximum height. And then with any luck, we don't spread too much further than that. But our spiritual growth or our intellectual growth, which are really the same thing, although they don't mean exactly the same thing, begin slowly and then accelerate. That is an organic growth curve. And so it does appear that in the early childhood program, they're just dancing in the woods and making soup. And in the elementary school, sometimes we chafe or balk a little bit because it seems that the education is proceeding perhaps a little more slowly than the education across town at the schools that some, other, some of our friends' children go to. But if we can honor the acceleration of organic growth, it's not linear, it's not stepwise. And by the time they get to middle school and then into high school, they are becoming themselves and they are rapidly accelerating in the development of their spirit, their intellect, their consciousness, whatever you have. And because the growth of the spirit is not bounded by the natural world, the way the growth of the physical body is, the physical body stops growing at a certain point, that arrow heading upward, there's no telling where it will go. And so I sometimes say to my colleagues, I feel like we are in high school, the midwives of adolescence. I don't mind being a male midwife. And our job is to, uh, Beth talked about removing hindrances. Our job is to remove hindrances from a curve that is accelerating faster and faster and faster. 
And so a student can leave our high school and go to Harvard and decide to become a math major. And that's currently, I think, sort of in the works. Um, the idea that because children in early childhood programs are cutting carrots, they won't get into Harvard or they won't be able to do calculus doesn't honor that growth curve that I just showed you. I have a lot more to say about that, but I'm going to skip it. How else can we characterize this transition? Well, if you are watching this and you have children in middle school, I would ask you to consider, are your children asking for um, increasing amounts of freedom? Are they demanding increasing amounts of freedom? If they aren't, they soon will be. And managing um, the transition from a relatively unfree early childhood to the freedom of adulthood is another aspect of teaching high school students. With every freedom comes responsibility. There's no such thing as a right without an attendant obligation or responsibility. And so I think our job as high school teachers is to give students increasingly appropriate areas and arenas and ways in which they can be free, and then also saddle them with appropriate responsibilities, not ones they can't handle, but ones that are appropriate to the rights that they have now earned. And so that makes um, high school in some ways much messier internally than early childhood. Early childhood students, I guess, drop flour on the floor and probably some of those carrots that they're cutting. High school students, you give them freedom and they mess it up. And you still have to love them and take them into your classroom and teach them calculus and also teach them to be responsible. Adolescents are also hugely ideal idealistic. They have a hunger for justice, for honesty and authenticity. I often say to my colleagues, the number one tool in your toolkit as a high school teacher is your authenticity. They need to see this idealism reflected deliberately in their teachers, in the curriculum, in their opportunities for growth in the world and through projects, through internships, through travel. The motto of our high school is small school, big world. And we try in as many ways as we possibly can to make our building the hub from which the students go to enter the world, whether it's for lunch in town in Stockbridge or Munich and Costa Rica, which in a COVID year are, um, I don't know, plans rather than actualities. And then the last thing I'll say um, is that the, 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 the travel through high school is, is a voyage of individuation. These students are becoming themselves. Some are shy and introverted. Some are not shy and extroverted. Some become furniture makers and chefs. Some become family doctors and commercial pilots. There's no telling what they're going to be. Someone asked the question in preparation for this webinar, uh, what qualities do we see in Waldorf graduates? Um, and I would say that I hear over and over again that they are well and truly themselves. And I can think of nothing better than, than that as a goal for us as teachers. They are resilient, they are flexible, they are creative. And returning to my theme at the very start of the evening, this idea that our social health is really three-part. It's one social organism, we are all in it together. But economically, we have to live as brothers and sisters. We have to live in solidarity with one another. Politically, we have to be the equals of each other. We have to help up those who have been denied rights. We may have to curtail the rights of people who are abusing them. We have to live in equality with one another. And culturally, spiritually, with what insight and initiative we bring, whether we're developing new technology or making art or simply trying to solve problems in our relationships, we have to be free. And so if our students can graduate the equal of any human being on earth in an appropriate measure, living in solidarity with all the other humans on earth as well as possible, and implementing as freely as possible all of the gifts that they as individuals, as unique individuals have, I think we'll have done a pretty darn good job. Couple more questions. Um, how will my child be prepared to succeed in high school when they're playing and making art all day? Well, the good news is Pamela told you by eighth grade, they're making DC motors. Um, and I can tell you that half our students at the high school come from 
Berkshire Waldorf School and half come from Montessori school, public school, home school, prep school, any other school you can think of. And often by about Thanksgiving time, right around now, you can't really tell if you walk in the classroom who had um, eight years of a Waldorf school and who did not. You, the kids who did not take to it like fish to the water if it's the right school for them. Uh, my kid wants a big school or a sports team or something different. Well, we have three seasons of sports. We're joining the Massachusetts Independent Athletic Association. Um, if when the world allows sports again, um, come play at our school and or go to a bigger school and sit on the bench. Um, I'm worried that my kid won't get into college or become a successful adult unless they go to a rigor, rigorous high school. Uh, to cut through a, a long way of talking around it, I'll just say I went to a Waldorf school, I went to an Ivy League college with one year of advanced standing. I was totally and utterly prepared. And when it came time to be involved with the founding of the high school that I'm representing tonight, um, I and my colleagues, there are about a dozen of us, Pamela was on the committee, um, she was one of us. Um, we were utterly clear that there is no compromise, there need be no compromise between an academically rigorous high school or a very good academic high school and a Waldorf high school. Rudolf Steiner had a PhD in Germany in the 19th century, which is um, harder to obtain than a PhD in the United States in the 21st century, where if you just hang out at a university for about 10 years, they just shove it at you and tell you to go. Um, so I can tell you our students get into 90% of the colleges they apply to. It's a shocking number, but it's true. Robustly over the last 16 years since we started graduating students, they get into 90% of the colleges they apply to and 80% of them get into their first choice of college. Um, I looked at some stats in preparation for tonight. Uh, we, we have two students currently at Ivy League schools at Harvard and Columbia. Um, at first tier school like Wesleyan, the admissions rate is somewhere between 15 and 20%. We've had five kids apply and three of them had been admitted. So that's 60%. Um, we feel like if you come to the Waldorf High School, you get a great academic education. You also get an education as a human being and you get an education with strange things in it like blacksmithing and required art courses and required internships and projects. One of our students is going to San Diego in December, um, COVID willing to work in um, genetic research for medical uses. Um, this is a girl who, uh, if you walked into our classroom, you couldn't pick her out, but inside she is gung-ho for genetic research and she'll go away for a month and do that. All right, I've said enough. Jenna, thank you for all the time. Um, I think I addressed most of the questions. Oh, one more, transition to college. Um, one of our students went to RIT. She's now a researcher for Bausch and Lomb. There are 16,000 undergrads at RIT, um, and there were seven students in her graduating class. Our classes in the high school are now larger. She said, when I was in high school, I had a small group of friends, and when I went to RIT, I had a small group of friends, and I loved them all. Another student who came to our high school feeling it was rel relatively small quickly learned. She said, um, I'm here to learn and after school and on weekends, I still have all my friends who go to other schools. So school is about education, kids. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Pamela. What an incredible and deeply moving evening this has been. My sincere thanks to Mrs. Giles, Ms. Oakley, and Dr. Sagarin for their time. It truly has been an honor to hear from you all. Remember this video will be made available for those who were unable to attend or would like to watch it again. Lastly, from us all at Berkshire Waldorf School, we thank you for being a part of this beautiful community. The choice that we are all making to bring Waldorf education into our children's and families' lives is truly a game changer. We wish you all good health and a good evening. Thank you.